there's a little bit of a cheat sheet at the end, there's a glossary, <laughs> so you can go and, and, and look it up. But, but basically, there's plenty of the books that you can well, you can learn more about the details and the science behind it. So it's, 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 the purpose of the book is to stimulate the imagination. This is what I'm saying. It's a 68 page book with a 10 page glossary of, of, to explain it at the end. And I did wonder partly about that, whether you thought actually the people most likely to read it would they be people coming brand new to this subject or people who already had at least a smattering of knowledge of these things who would, who would look at this as a new way to think about these things. Well, the great surprise for me. This book has been out, still very young, it's been out for a few weeks now. But the great surprise for me, for me was precisely to see different kinds of people picking up the book and reading it. And so I, and, and I found that people who already are familiar or conversant with some of the concepts here, they will read it in a different way. They will whisk through it and chuckle at the metaphors and feel, feel, feel great, feel clever because they know what they're talking about in a, in a more technical way. But other people who have not been exposed to these concepts before uh, often say that it's, 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 it feels poetic to them and, and it does awaken them to the fact that science has a lot of creativity in it, has a lot of poetry in it, is not this hardcore and cold series of facts that perhaps they thought it was. And, and, and so that to me is, is very valuable. And, so if, and it's true, different people read it in different ways. Um, but but that, that's, that's, that's great. I, I'm, I'm happy with that. And honestly, if nothing else, if people read it and think, there are easier ways, there are simpler ways, not shrouding ourselves in this journalistic, long-winded, polysyllabic vocabulary that we tend to do because it's science and we naturally do that and it protects us almost from the public rather than engages us with it. Uh, there's a, there's a, I think an Indian uh, linguist who said that language is the language of the marketplace, meaning you know, it is for communication, it is for being able to sell your wares or getting an idea across. The thing is, everyone thinks that their, I, their way of communication is the most efficient. So it's a point that Roberto brought up about how the people down the corridor from him probably speak a different language. And in the field that you're in, the words that you use communicate, well, all of the, to me, gobbledygook that was on these scientific papers was the best and most succinct way to communicate to their colleagues, but it means nothing to anyone else. And I think there are two um, other points of but I think everyone should, everyone communicating in any way, if they understand their subject well enough, they should be able to communicate in the most simple terms. Um, my PhD boss, he said he'd given his thesis to his grandmother and um, said that you know, if, you're, if you're studying science and you can't explain it to your grandma, then you've failed. <laughs> and secondly, I now work in a university on an interdisciplinary project, so I work with people across the university. And I notice how scientists, this is the irony, that scientists, physicists, geneticists, my background is in genetics, are told, to, like in FameLab, we, we now know that we must be able to explain ourselves in very simple language and, um, to, to the public. We have a duty and responsibility because the taxpayer is funding this. But then I go into fields like anthropology. I'm based in an anthropology department. I think, great, this is the you know, study of humanity. And I go to a lecture, and the words that they're using sound like English, but I have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> and the problem is, I'm sitting around a table with an anthropologist, with a biologist, with a philosopher, with a doctor. And um, we have to be able to speak um, to each other in a way that we can understand. It's not even within biology or within physics. Because the way our university sees it uh, at UCL is that if you're looking at the great challenges of the world, you have to bring an interdisciplinary um, view on it. You can't, we can't, and, and I think this is education of the future, that we will no longer, we must know the basis of our subject, but we'll no longer be able to sit in the silos that we used to. And this is increasingly important. And I, I love what you said about writing your job description in these words. And I think it should be an exercise that yeah. every scientist has to do to to try and simplify it to, to this basic level. It's as long as the potential employers are in on the deal, otherwise it could just lose you the job. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's about clarity of communication. I mean, everyone thinks they're speaking in the clearest way to the people that they're speaking to, but it's a very close circle. George, I want to talk to you there about the, lang in, the language of the marketplace. And mm -hmm. Of course, we live in a world now where one of the things people do to try and sell things is they shroud them in pseudoscience. We've all seen those adverts where here comes the science bit, contains moxibolaline, toluene 7, and 3 grams, which will guarantee your skin lasts 
So we need that thing where almost not understanding is seen as the goal of science sometimes. How do we break through that to have people being confident enough in the science so that when we get to the science bit, it doesn't just mean you won't understand it, but you know, we'll pat you on the head. Absolutely. I think the only solution is to bring science back into the public sphere. Where it started, actually, more than science started in the public sphere, was uh, public lectures were at uh, the heart of scientific culture. But then gradually science became more professional and uh, it um, acquired all the attributes of professionalism, which is uh, every uh, individual becomes immersed into a particular vocabulary so they can communicate with their peers and so on. But we see now <coughs> a return, if you like, into into the beginnings of science uh, for two reasons. First, obviously, you know, science has to communicate itself to the public. It has to become relevant. Otherwise, there are several risks for our technological society to, be, to completely go off the rails. This is a, there's a social reason for that. But there's also a scientific reason as well. Uh, the problems that uh, humanity faces uh, today in the 21st century can all, only be solved if multiple scientists from different fields come together to deliver solutions. And to begin that, they have to speak the same language. Uh, we need that, uh, was it bubble fish that Douglas Adams came up with, the little fish, the kind Bagel of fish, the yeah. fish, yes. Uh, and that's science communication. We, we have to be able to understand what everybody else is saying. Uh, and it's very essential. So bringing it back to the public sphere and engaging more with other, other you know, citizens will definitely do that. One of the um, objections, I think, um, scientists say, so whenever you write a newspaper article or a book or, or anything to do with, or if, you're, if you do a TV documentary or a radio program and you have half an hour or 15 minutes to talk about something that probably is quite a complex idea of science, you will, you will be criticized widely by many people and what they will say is you have oversimplified. Because within the language that they use, if there's a, a series of complex ideas. I don't, I don't think there's so much wrong with, or with simplifying. Well, that's, that's a very good point. It's the Einstein one, is it? Things should be made as simple as possible, but not any simpler. Yes, of course. <coughs> but then, when we talk about genetics, when we talk about cosmology, when we talk about particle physics, those are complicated, difficult subjects. You can't give them justice in any amount of time without going into very technical details. And frankly, I'm not the point. We, when we're talking between ourselves, between the specialists, of course, you want to go into the details and you want to do this in a mathematical form, where language is just an approximation we use just with a gloss over the math, really. And when we're talking to people who are not specialists, like ourselves, what we need to get across is the story, is the, is the fundamental content. What is it that we're doing? Why are we doing it? Why is it exciting? And yes, of course, there's lots of detail that gets, gets lost in this process, but I do maintain this is an important detail as long as, of course, your scientific facts are basically accurate. And, and that, that's, that's my endeavor in the book. I tried to simplify it, certainly, but not to an extent that I wasn't happy with the science that came out of it. And so I, I could still justify it to myself and say, yes, this is simplified. It's put in metaphors and not in And, and I ways. think that's always possible. If you have the imagination enough, it's always possible to simplify it and still be accurate. And George's point is really good about society because, for example, um, with cuts to our national health system at the moment, for example, I think there's going to be a big push to, to digital healthcare and to people using apps on their phones or interfacing with um, sensors. I don't think there's, I mean, as these technologies become so intimate with our health and our life, and the advertising you mentioned, we, we need to have a greater literacy or general understanding, and to do that, we don't need all of the excessive Patients want to know what what does this do for me? Why am I using it? And is you know there's certain questions they have that I think the scientists get bogged down with way too much complexity that is completely unnecessary. Yeah, the way I've often said it is it's, it's a bit like you go to a till at the supermarket. You don't expect people to necessarily when they get to the end of the bill go you're off by two p, but you want that instinct to know if you've been overcharged by ten pounds or overcharged by ten pounds. You should have that. It's going to become that feeling for science, where something's way off being, uh, rather than expecting them to understand every nuance of and, it. And to, to make, make language too complex also has the effect of not just making someone seem very clever. What does that mean? It means you're on your ivory tower, and it means that people who aren't fluent with that language feel it's too hard and it's too difficult. And that, 
science isn't hard or isn't difficult if someone's engaged with the idea, if it becomes something beautiful to read or to, to watch or to, to experience, and they're you know, going to want to engage with it and think, that's not so hard, that's really something I want to know about. You've talked a couple of times here about the use of long words, and I wondered if uh, any of you are familiar with Daniel Oppenheim's study at Princeton a couple of years ago, the problems of, if I get this right, consequences of erudite vernacular used irrespective of necessity. Problems with using long words needlessly, which looked at student tendencies to write long things, the perception that if they wrote nice long words in their essays, they'd be appreciated more and thought more intelligent. This was not only did it inhibit people's ability to understand them, but they thought less of them, actually. We do live in a world where people do appreciate good communication, but the perception is the other way round, that long words equals cleverness. I think that maybe the TED Talks and platforms like that have changed things. Um, and, and, um, and playing that, yeah, there's also thesis in three, there's a, there's a whole range of um, um, initiatives to push communication that makes it widely available to everyone you know, without looking for the, you know, having to sound clever. But still, as you were saying before, there's still some stigma attached in professional circles if you are a public communicator, if you, if you engage with the public, actively spend your time doing it, you're not a real scientist to an extent. Some of our colleagues, I think, feel that way. And it's a little bit of a remnant, I think, of this kind of, I feel clever because I only use difficult words and only mathematics and you know, there's no way I, I'm ever going to compromise in this. And I think that's just untenable as a position. Let me just add something here that uh, I've witnessed over the years working with scientists and helping them communicate. Um, you know, vocabulary is just one aspect of language, and uh, human communication is far more complex than just vocabulary, obviously. And when we uh, bring science back into the public sphere, as I discussed, then we should distinguish at least two categories of science. And um, if I may distinguish them, I would say there is like enjoyable science, like for instance, <clears throat> let's say cosmology, cosmology is an enjoyable science, it ponders the big questions and it's, it gives us great pleasure to understand those questions. But there's also what I call not very enjoyable science, which is, <laughs> which is not a science that affects our own lives. <laughs> and by that I mean, for instance, you know, climate change or uh, health issues, uh, stuff like that, very important aspects. Now when you start as a scientist to communicate that part, that kind of science, then you are immediately faced with a whole lot of different class of problems. The vocabulary doesn't solve it. Let's just give you an example. A uh, typical example is climate change. I believe that uh, you know the various scientists out there who can very clearly communicate the science of climate change. Now why doesn't that affect some people's opinions, for example? Because the debate is mostly political rather than scientific. I would argue. Uh, you know, uh, conservatives think climate change is a socialist uh, plot. Socialists think that this is a, a way to regulate the economy. So the whole sort of science gets bogged down in, into a political conversation. So these are other uh, aspects of science communication that perhaps most scientists are not aware of, perhaps. They're not prepared to deal with. And some of them, you know, they get very discouraged when they start a conversation about this kind of science. They, let's say they're, they're not very enjoyable science and they get, you know, attacked by all sides. Absolutely, you're, you're, you're right, and we, the cosmologists, are lucky because our science is useless. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's the enjoyable I'll science. I'll take it back. It's not useless. It, it is not useful in the, in, in the next five or ten years. But still, it's a cultural enterprise and such. But imagine being a geneticist, mm. uh, and you want to create a new organism, let's say, that might, you know, save the world from a disease, but then again, are you playing God? Okay. What's your agenda? So. But that's what engages, that's what I mean, that's what engages the public because these are technologies that can really impact their lives on a very personal level. I mean, I wrote about reproductive technology and I thought no one would ever read the book and the interest around it was incredible because I realized it's a very intimate, very personal Human you wrote about reproductive technology, you call the book like a virgin, you thought no one would read it. <laughs> <laughs> This is exactly why we have to be able to communicate complex ideas in a way that doesn't that that makes it 
um, open to engagement with people who don't feel they have the language that you have, and you don't lock them out by using complicated terms, but you welcome them into a, into a discussion. In a way, I, I think when I write, I try to um, trick people a little bit because I start with a nice story of someone, or a nice story I found somewhere, and then you drop some science into it later. So it's not about... Um, it's not a scientific paper. It's about welcoming, drawing people in. Roll up, roll up, <laughs> enjoy the show, and then, and then you, then you get a little bit of complexity, but not in a way to scare them off. And that that means that people are more able to engage in a debate that is something scary, like you're trying to create an artificial womb. You know, what does that mean? What are the and this is where ethics and um, and regulation come in and, and um, that conversation. This is a very important thing because if scientists speak in a very complex way and can't simplify their language, how is that going to be communicated to, to people who make policy, to the people who report science, to the public who could be victims of scaremongering by the people who report science? So at all levels it has There's to so be. many things I want to pick up on there, but the panel, as you see, have already reached that point of being self-sustaining. They don't actually need questions or me or anything. They can just carry on by themselves. <laughs> so this is probably as good a point as any to start opening opening things up to a broader spectrum. So I think, have we got anything? Uh, also, yes. can, we get a hand, can we get a hand help in? So Ria is going to be our medium to communicate with 50 other countries. Hopefully it's on. Yes, it's on. It's on. Hi. Um, so we have a question here from Simona in Italy. Um, and just a second, sorry. It's all in an office sort of way. Yeah. <laughs> Is it on? Yeah. Oh, nice. yeah. Yay. Okay, and um, we have a question here from Simona in Italy. And she would like to know, um, do you think that women communicate science in a different way? In terms of their language? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, think it's I think it's a question for everybody equally, isn't yeah. it? Really? You know, I, I remember writing something once and someone said to me, you write like a man. And I was like, oh, Which man? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I just think it varies by personality. But um, I don't want to point any fingers, but... Okay, this recently the Royal Society had a book prize, and it was a popular science book prize. And we know that there is a, you know, there, there is a, the, the deficit of women at the high levels of, well, everything in, in your business industry, banks, government, media. Um, but in science, it's particularly acute, much more in your field than in biological sciences. But say, you'll start with 60% um, female undergraduates, and you probably have, if you're lucky, 20% female professors, even in, in biology. So the, in the Royal Society, you know, I mean, I, I'm not picking on them, I kind of am, but I'm, you know, in, um, in uh, institutions that represent the top minds in science, you will find that it's very male-dominated. So uh, their fellows, uh, their uh, membership is very male-dominated, because by the time you get to that level, there probably aren't many women left. So they have a book prize, Popular Science Writing. I think it's been going for seven years or so, I'm not quite sure, but they have never in all of that time had a female winner. In the shortlist there's usually one woman, but they never make it out of the shortlist. And so my question was, okay, so women don't get to a high place in the study and the research of science, but why aren't there any women? There must be women authors. So then who's picking the books and are they picking them by the type of so, there's nothing as creative as this, and maybe, and um, maybe, maybe there is a difference. Maybe women write more creatively and not so uh, form in a formulaic manner that's recognised as this is science communication, and maybe that's why they aren't chosen because it's a little bit um, different, a little bit creative. Just in the name of science, though, shouldn't I be saying it's a very small data set to go for? <laughs> The Winton Prize this year was won by Mark Dovnik for um, uh, he... Stuff Matters, which is a fantastic book. Great quote from me on the cover, but don't get that bias you in any way. But I mean, I've also been a judge on the Welcome Trust Power Science Book Prize every year, and that's at least the year I was a judge, it was a female winner. Uh, it's at least one other time being won. But I don't think it was a factor for the judges, as 
the gender of the writer. It was about the quality of the book, which presumably with that price, that's, maybe the best books just happened to be written by men. The, but that, that's the argument that's always brought up of why there aren't many women. We haven't chosen it to gender balance, we've chosen the best one, but I can't believe that the, everyone's really saying that women's writing isn't good enough to win it, and maybe women's writing, maybe it is different. No, the welcome's different, they did have a good balance, I have to say they did have a good balance of uh, women. Um, I'm just saying that maybe the way not just scientific papers are written, but science, public communication of science is viewed, is still too bound by expectations of what it should be, and, and it's not as creative as this. I don't see... George, Roberto, any thoughts on this? I believe this is a virtually impossible um, question to answer. That's why I asked you. Yeah. <laughs> not only do we have very few data points, but there's so much bias in, uh, in just even reflecting and analysing the data points that we have. And um, I don't know, maybe some social scientists should, should get a project to look into it. But I, I, I don't know how to answer this question. Do women write in a different way? I don't know. The problem is there's, there's, it's one of myriad factors, wouldn't you suspect? I mean, age, ethnicity, background, all these things may affect how we write, and certainly and which authors I mean, we read I mean, when we were a kid. There, are, the there are other cultures in the world where women speak in a totally different way than men, yeah? Uh, in, in Asia, for instance, you know? But in our Western culture, this, this does not happen. I mean, we have, like, you know, education which is mixed and so on. So I, I wouldn't expect any huge differences between men and women. But then again, honestly, I don't know how to answer this question. It might also be an opportunity, just like as uh, seniority progresses, you find sadly less and less women in the higher echelons of science. And the ones who survive the system have to become more aggressive in a sense, and they have to uh, um, comply with expectations of the system in which they, they are in. And communication science is typically not something that's strongly encouraged in that, in that cutthroat competition. And so you don't get the, the, the chance because women have ready to fight harder than men for various yeah, reasons to, 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 to climb higher. I, I, was, like, I, I was just going to say that, like uh, George said, um, it's probably not that depending on whether you're um, uh, a woman or a man or a gay Jamaican or it doesn't matter. It's a, but not, not who you actually are in the body you're in, but the experiences that you've come through and the. Um, the curriculum that you've been put through and the pressures that you've been put through. It's a, it's, a, it's a view of the world and it doesn't matter what body that it comes in, I suppose. Okay, we'll go back to some more questions. But since we are here, we also finally address the kind of fundamental question at the start of all this. Why is English so associated with science? Why is it, do we all accept on the panel that it is now the main language of international science communication? I would say it's the international language of uh, science translation, but fundamentally, I believe that the real communication science between specialists certainly is the language of mathematics. So English happens to be the international accepted publication language, and the one that we communicate in the countries for historical reasons, uh, American dominations, and so forth. Uh, but fundamentally, when we want to be precise and we want to really get into the details of what we're doing, we have to resort to a different kind of language altogether, which is neither English nor any other natural language, it's the language of maths. And Maybe your next book could be communicating the cosmos in the 12 most common mathematical symbols. Well, it's been said, it's been said that uh, your sales have for every equation in the book, so I'm not too hopeful. <laughs> yes, I mean, Stephen Hawking says that he was famous, that he was told that for a brief history of time, for every equation he put in the book, he would lose uh, a million sales of the book, I think the phrase was as well. And he got it down to one equation. Oh, but then, then I'm okay, because I, you know, I don't mind losing a million sales. I don't have a million sales. Today, yes, so. <laughs> it might have been something, it might have been 50% or whatever it, whatever it was as well. Actually, do we, do, we, do we accept English and science have been, for whatever reasons have become bedfellows? I think English is the language of science, but is it the language of science communication? Um, I don't know, I think that varies by country, um, because there's still a huge appetite for translation of um, um, popular science books written in English. There's a huge um, translation going on in, in, in various different countries. So. You'll find in Northern Europe, where people will probably have a good fluency in English, they'll read popular science books in English, but 
I mean, I've heard an Italian translation, Japanese, Arabic, Bulgarian. I mean, you just 